chalk with your host Reggie B. Come on, let's all join in. Free your voice, it's your choice, all right here. Oh, simply stray, simply stray talk. Speak on it, because it's your dime, now spend it. Lord have mercy, why can't you just answer the phone like a regular person? Well, somebody clearly got up on the wrong side of the bed or didn't get that text message this morning. And somebody else clearly woke up under the age of 15. Woman, don't make me. Don't make you what? I'm like a lioness on a zebra. I'll put your ass on the ground. (laughs) Anyway, I know you didn't call me just to pick a fight. What do you want? I want to know if you think the black community is benefiting from the removal of statues and the NFL playing lift every voice and sing before one game. Oh, wow. You coming with the serious questions early in the morning. Yes, I am, because right now I am in my feelings, and I want your thoughts on things they're doing right now in response to racism and discrimination. I understand. I also want to know if you agree that black women are the most disrespected people on the planet. Okay, now this is deep. Well, get a bigger shovel. Now talk to me. Personally, I think there are more important initiatives that need to take place. I guess you could say at least it's a start, but I don't see it that way because you have to ask yourself, is the goal to implement visual change or mental change? Okay, so we're on the same page so far. Now, regarding the question about if black women are the most disrespected women on the planet, that's tough to answer because- What do you mean it's tough to answer? Hold on. Now, you know I love my beautiful Nubian queens, and I will always stand up for them. But there are some things now. There's some other things you have to consider with that question. I'm not denying. Black women have had to suffer a lot. But to answer that question requires a more in-depth answer. We cannot forget about the Native American women. And you know I don't like to argue about whose oppressor was the best at beating and dividing us. I'm trying to see your point, and I'm not saying that you don't care about black women. But it's hard to know who's on our side and who's against us. It could be the way we've been betrayed by the media and television over the years. I am not saying that I need a black man to give me the world. But when you see a sister being disrespected, say something. And don't run to social media telling the world how white women and women of other races treat black men better. We are not trying to leave black men behind. We just want you to know we can help hold it down with you. Hey, I hear you. It's like we want the same things. But so much outside influence has affected how we treat, think, and talk to each other. Why can't everybody have this conversation we just did? I know, right? Listen, why don't you come over and I'll call Angelique and we can all check out the Simply Straight Talk Show. Today's show is about black community focus. Hey, sounds like a plan. Do you want me to pick up some? Stop at Mama's table and pick up one grilled salmon with mixed vegetables, the seafood feast pot. I already called it in, so by the time you get there, it should be ready and still hot by the time you get here. How did you do all of that so fast? Oh yeah, is it paid for? Boy, we waiting. Hurry up. Come on before the show starts. Something feel mighty, 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 mighty fishy about all this. Yeah, yeah. I'm hanging up now. Hurry up and buy. Hello to every one of our Simply Straight Talk listeners. Are you ready to free your mind and free your voice? Well, you're listening to the right podcast. So let's get this real talk started with your host, Reggie Maddox. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Simply Straight Talk Show. This is your host, Reggie Maddox. And today we're going to talk about black community focus. Now, I wanted to have this discussion because As you know, there is a lot that has been taking place in the past couple months. And there are some things that I am noticing regarding the original discussions and the original motivation and drive for the protests and how things have quickly swung into something totally different to where the original objective of the protest has been pushed aside. Now, When we talk about black community focus, you know, I'm really speaking about where we as African-Americans, as black people need to focus our attention. 
where we need to maintain a straight line and a direct path because there are things that we need to address that are being minimized for, I'm, I'm trying to think of the right word, but you know, the, the things that we should be striving for is being minimized in order to give us a, I guess you can say like a period victory. You know what I'm saying? Taking down statues, playing the black national anthem one time, uh, putting commercials on TV. It's like you're doing these things, but are they really to say that we're looking to institute and implement long term change and correction in the direction of this country and in the way that the black community can not only sustain itself, but also grow professionally and personally. And I don't see that in what's taking place. I really don't see that taking place in today's society based on everything that has happened. But after the murders of George Floyd, Ahmed Aubrey and Breonna Taylor, you know, the black community has basically reached a point to where they're saying enough is enough regarding how black people are treated by the police department. That was pretty much regarding that, how we're being treated by the police department and the judicial, the judicial system overall. Now for the rest of the world, the racism and discrimination is only more visible because of the media and the public videos that are now starting to surface all over. But for us black people, this has been an everyday fight and struggle. Th this is every day for us. This is what we see every day. Now, our experience has always been through the lens of oppression at the hands of systemic racism dating back hundreds of years. And I will admit that, you know, there are some white people who say that they don't see racism. You have to tell them when, they're, when something is wrong. I don't believe a personally, I don't believe that a person can observe a situation and not know that something is wrong. You know what I'm saying? You know it. And we have some black people. We got some black people that prefer to stay silent, not say anything and go with the flow. You know, they, they feel like, Hey, if I stay quiet, then maybe I'll be accepted and I won't lose my position, my career, my job. I don't want to be attached to black people like that. We get that. We have it in a lot of politicians until they need votes. Okay. But anyway, y'all know I go on a tangent on that, but I want y'all feedback on this show, man. I want y'all to tell me, how do you feel? Tell me, do you think I'm heading in the right direction in which these are things that we should include on the, on the agenda of how we go forward, moving forward long-term you see, some people will say that there is discomfort on both sides, but I say only the oppressor is uncomfortable with this conversation because they know they're doing wrong. They know they're not holding up their promise, the obligation. So we are past the point of trying to figure out how to have this conversation because it's not a problem of having the conversation. And people keep saying, you know, we need to figure out how to open up the dialogue and how to have the conversation. No, we're past all that. For the black community, this means we must focus on what strategic actions will provide a long-term solution for our children and our great-great-grandchildren. That is one thing that other cultures are very good at doing, is creating something. One person in that family is going to say, you know what? I'm going to open a business for my child and my child can pass it on. And they pass on corporations and businesses and they grow and they grow. But many of us as black people are living moment to moment and we don't set other people up as far as our own, but we set other people up. And that's something that we have to change. Yes, this is me and this has been my experience for my entire existence. We have to make the sacrifice that we're going to set up our great grandchildren, our children, that we have to create something for our race. Our race has done so much, so much throughout history. And we should not be where we are right now. So we have to learn to change that. 
Now, I have watched summits and conferences and, you know, a whole lot of other alleged venues that are supposed to help the black community or create a point of discussion. But they have no real push for long term solutions or steps to create a permanent change. See, that's the objective that we have to be looking for. What can we do as black people to really push our own communities to a point to where we are implementing true change? And I mean change across the board, not getting one person in the NFL or in the NBA or into the NHL or into the uh, into baseball. We need to create change that is going to be long term to where we are creating a financial system for ourselves where we are building and supporting our own. Now I know whenever you say supporting our own, a lot of people say, well, the whole myth about black businesses, black businesses don't do this. Black businesses got poor customer services, black business, you know, always run out of stuff. That's because when you have a business, but you don't have the manufacturing or the distribution, you are at the hands of other people. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit because there are things that we have to do in order to take ourselves into another level, into another dimension to where we can be more self-sustaining and not so reliant. And we have to do this across the boards. So that is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some steps that we need to do, some actions that we need to take things we need to demand that's going to set us up long term. Okay. And that's what I want to talk about that because if we are going to implement proactive ways for change and opportunities, then our focus need to be united and centered on one common goal. You got that united and centered on one common goal. Now, these are my ideas. And I want you guys to tell me, do you agree? What, what, what do you think about it? Okay. I need your input on this because the first thing I think that we really need to push for as a black community, as a whole is the education system. Not only do we need the schools in our community. Okay. Upgrade it with the right technology, computers, laptops, Okay. We need all that stuff, enough classroom space. We need this. Okay. But one thing that I really want to push for and make it a mandate as part of the educational system is it should be mandated that African American history is taught in all schools. Okay. And I'm not talking about this abbreviated version, like what I got when I came in school, you know, when I was in school, it was Martin Luther King and Frederick Douglass. Okay. But the truth is I was never taught about Malcolm X. I was never talking about James Baldwin. I was never taught about Fannie Lou Hamer. I was never talking about Jeannie Nicavani. I was never taught about these people. You're talking about some great intellectuals. James Baldwin is probably one of the great literature authors of our time. And he is totally left out of our history. When I was in school, like I said, we never discussed black authors. As a matter of fact, the most common black character, okay, was Tom Peterson from To Kill a Markenberg. That is what I was taught when it came to literature. To Kill a Markenberg, the one black man who had one arm who was accused of killing a woman who was rescued by a white man. That is what I was taught. I wasn't taught about James Baldwin. I wasn't talk about taught about none of these other great authors. Now you cannot teach white American history without African American history. The Buffalo soldiers and the Harlem Hellfighters contributed to so much to the American war. I recently, they, they made an update. Now they made the movie Pearl Harbor like three or four times. And I've seen all of them. And the recent one that they did 
there was only one black person in the movie and they showed them from the back like about 20 seconds. When I got up to leave the movie, it was his family sitting in front of me. Okay. It was a father with his son and, and, and the, I, I think a wife or girlfriend. Okay. But I know it was the family, but when, when we got up to leave, the son said, dad, how come no black people help fight wars? How come we don't fight? And to look at that far, his father's face, it was like, I could see his heart drop because my heart dropped. My heart literally dropped. This young kid who had to be all of what, 10, 11, was able to recognize the fact that in American war movies, black people are non-existent. We don't contribute unless it's some type of comedy or we're playing some goofy role. So to see this, it, it really made me feel like, wow, how heartbreaking is it that our young African-American boys look at these movies and they see no reflection of themselves in these so-called great historical movies. Our young black women, they see these movies and, and don't recognize the fact that no black women contributed in, in any way. But this is what we're dealing with. And I think this is the key reason we need to have African-American studies as a mandated part of history classes in all schools. How do you expect our young black men and women to identify with this country if they have no part in it? If you deny them the right to know the contributions of their ancestors, if you want them to feel connected and, and, and a part of this country, then show them the truth. And don't, don't, don't waffle the truth in muddy water, tell them the truth. But you don't want to do that because telling young black men and women the truth about this history will give them a sense of pride of who they are. And that scares you. But that's the American way. Bring it back. Okay. All right. Next. So that's one thing I feel we really need to work on is the education system. We need to get African-American studies included in our history classes, our world history classes. It needs to be taught in schools. It needs to be taught. Next, I want to talk about corporate America. Okay. Now, my biggest issue with corporate America is the indirect discrimination. Now, indirect discrimination in the workplace is out of control. And I'm telling you this from personal experience. I'm telling you what I've seen. And I'm telling you this from other people that I know personally have been a victim of indirect discrimination. Now, let me explain to you what I mean regarding indirect discrimination. Indirect discrimination happens when there is a policy that applies in the same way for everybody, but disadvantages a group or a person who shares a protected characteristic, you know, like race, gender, age, sex, all that type of stuff. And you are disadvantaged as a part of that group. Now, if this happens, okay, the personal organization applying the policy, you know, must show that there is a good reason for it. And the problem is they don't because the only thing they say is, well, I made the change because of the job. I changed their schedule because of the job. I gave them that work assignment because of the job. They always find a way to say that the reason they did this policy or implemented this rule or made this person do this was because of the job. Okay. Now, the thing about it is this. As indirect discrimination is often not obvious, I'm here to tell you that many HR departments or equity and inclusion offices are not trained or they lack the knowledge to properly identify it. African Americans need to push for more detailed labor laws to recognize this behavior and hold companies and businesses accountable. True situation. Now this is true. And what I'm, what I'm about to tell you is true. One community college 
started to offer a paid training to make uh, security officers special police officers. Well, the manager, who was white, he began to issue disciplinary letters to prevent black people from qualifying for the position. Because that was a new requirement they put in it. If you had a uh, disciplinary action within a year, you could not qualify for the job. So the white manager began to write disciplinary actions against the black employees. Now, when this was brought to HR's intention, they said it was job related. Despite the fact that all of the write-ups, all of the things that they was documenting that was in those write-ups, nothing was ever documented before. Nothing was ever said before. Now, this manager also required all black people who worked on midnight to park in the back of the building and he did not make the same requirement for all other shifts. Now, when this was brought up, it was said that, well, you know, they sometimes do that because they don't want staff parking in the front because of visitors and guests and all that, which I would understand. But during the daytime and evening shift, when there's people there, they made, there was no requirement for people, for officers to park in the back. Only the midnight shift was told to park in the back of the building, which was all minorities. And when they arrived on work at 1045 or 11 o'clock, there was no one there. They got off work at 645. There was no staff there. So they didn't impede or interfere with uh, visitors, guests, or faculty staff in any way. The school ignored that also. So you see, and another situation was an employee wrote a letter to the director and the manager explaining that these individuals felt like they were being discriminated against. They felt like they were being targeted. Well, here is how that college responded to that individual concern about being discriminated against. Two days later, that person was getting, was written up. Out of the blue, just written up. So you see, this is what I talk about. I'm talking about when I say that we need to understand and fix this whole corporate America way of indirect discrimination. We got to fix this. Some people may say, well, that's blank discrimination. But the problem is when you're dealing with, you know, a group to where either they don't want to recognize it or it is the atmosphere or tone. That is what some people have to deal with on these jobs. We need laws. We need HR departments. We need the government to require that there are certain standards and there are properly trained people to where these things can be investigated and looked at and dealt with. And you don't have people who are ostracized or intentionally restricted from jobs based on their race, skin color, age, or sex. Okay? Now listen, we gotta take a quick break and I'll be right back in a few minutes. We'll be back with your host Reggie on Simply Straight Talk. Hey. We all know that Atlanta, Georgia is a big city and sometimes you might need just a little bit of help. But you know what? That's why we have Legs Concierge Services. Are you looking for someone to help you with errands, event planning, dog walking, organizing, shopping, or maybe you're in need of a personal assistant? Then you need to contact Legs Concierge Services operating in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information on these and additional services, contact rarmstrong105 at gmail.com. That's R-A-R-M-S-T-R-O-N-G-105 at gmail.com. Remember, time is precious, so let Les Concierge Services help you enjoy it so much better. We hope you're enjoying the show. As our listeners, this show is made possible because of your support. Make sure you click the subscribe button and leave a comment. Thank you for being a part of the show. And now back to your host, Reggie Maddox. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. We are here on the Simply Straight Talk Show. Today's topic is Black Community Focus. Now, 
as I get into this topic, I don't want people who are not black or African American to feel like you're being targeted. I'm simply expressing to you what it would take to help bring unity and what do what do I what I feel the black community needs in order to progress, in order to, you know, kind of move forward personally and professionally in this country. So just kind of listen and kind of understand, because as I tell you what I, what the things I think we need, I'm also giving you reasons. So hopefully that will resonate with you. Now, next, I want to talk about the black communities in general. Okay. African-American communities really struggle when it comes to community centers, daycare programs, and after hour programs. I know when I was a kid coming up, when I was in high school, I worked at a daycare center. Well, no, it was, it was a, um, a community center. And I'm telling you, it was the most fulfilling job of my life, you know, because I, a lot of the kids that came were younger kids and you can actually see when the kids kind of see you as a mentor. I even had parents come up to me and think about this. Now I'm only 14, 15 at this time. And I got parents pulling the pick up their kids telling me, you know, thank you. You know, my child really respects you. I can see a change. And that's the influence that we as black men and black women want to have for our younger generation. Okay. So that's why I feel like we need to get back to having these community centers because a lot of them were just closed down. A lot of cities just did away with them. In fact, you know, most summer programs are so costly that some parents are unable to have their, are unable to have their kids participate. Now, for those of you who got kids, you understand when you try to put your child in a football camp, a basketball camp, um, a dance camp, a band camp, some of these camps can run a parent like up to fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars And they're not even stay overnight camps. It's like you pick them up and drop them off. So things like that, man, we, we really got to start focusing on because, you know, having these programs, it can really assist in a child's personal and professional growth. You know, these resources are often lacking in the black communities, which means our young youth are engaging more street activity just from boredom. Okay. If we want to reduce the number of kids in the streets, we must provide options that's educational, develops mental and mental health and mental and physical health. And, you know, it inspires while helping them to explore business and financial options. This is not rocket science, but these are the things that's needed to give our young black men and women options in the world. You know, we cannot depend on the government for doing this. It's amazing how fast a liquor store can get a license, a bar or a strip club can get licensed in the black community. But real businesses of value are, 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 are pretty much cast aside and many people are probably probably recognize put it like this let me let me let me, let me go back a little bit let me go back a little bit because i get passionate about this when i talk about young kids in the streets okay and people also think they you know if your child runs the street they're gonna get tied to a gang you know i don't know if you guys when you do your history if you really look at your history of the vice lords, the vice lords were not just a gang. When you look at the, the real, the original vice lords, why that gang came to be and what that gang did for the community, man, this is what we need. Do your research because the conservative vice lords, what they accomplished, I mean, they created a town called, uh, teen town for young kids that included tutoring and community work. They had training programs for men and women job programs. I mean, this is the vice Lords. Now y'all hear vice Lord today. And y'all think of this game running around shooting and killing each other. That's not what the vice Lords was about. And even when the vice Lords came to see like, wow, our younger kids are out here robbing our own and killing our own. They stepped in. They met with both sides of the younger generation and said, listen, we need to do this. And they listened to those kids and put something together because they understood. And I don't mind. It's the devil's workshop. 
when you leave kids with no options after school to release that energy, if you give them no positive influence, the negative is always going to be the first to pop at them. Black communities, we need to start pushing for more community centers in our neighborhoods, more after hour programs, more programs that's affordable that our kids can participate in. We don't need them running the streets looking for something to do. We need to give them options of things to do that's going to help them in this world. Black businesses. Okay. So we just discussed what we can do in the black community to help our youth. The next is black businesses. Not only must we support our own black businesses, but we must create a pipeline of networking that establishes a supply and demand within the black business industry. Right now, we're in the mindset of build a business. You're black, start a business, let's support it. We need to do more than just starting storefront businesses, okay? We need to go beyond the storefronts. We need to get into manufacturing and distribution. As of now, black businesses are at the mercy of the big big other big corporations, okay, which are owned and operated by, you know, influential people of other races and culture. And that must makes up corporate America. Black business owners and black consumers must adapt a business model that allow for fair pricing and representation for each other's needs. We have to establish that. We have to create black businesses, support black businesses, You know, like the hair industry is a billion dollar industry. Black women are probably the majority buyers, the consumers in the hair product industry. We need to have our own hairline industry. We got the knowledge of the hair. We got the knowledge of what it takes. But we need to be putting that together and create our own product line. We don't need Gucci. We don't need... Louis Vuitton and all these other things create our own name brand items. Create our own. That's why all that's why a lot of black businesses fail. Whew, okay, I got to bring it back. Bring it back. Okay, let me get through this because I'll be here all day. I'm, I'm trying not to make this too long, but next is what I want to talk about is politics. And I think this is a big one for me. Because this is one of the most divisive areas, but one that requires the most work to help push the change in our communities. We need to elect officials that understand the importance of actively placing resources in the black community that will stimulate professional and personal growth. We need new minds and fresh ideas. We can never move forward now in the political arena as long as we are represented by people who are only connected to the black community when it's election time or from those who ignored and sacrificed their own people as pawns to only seek personal and self gain. And we need to implement the right people in the mayor and governor's position. We need to start prepping our youth to assume these positions with the knowledge of our history. And that is the problem. So many of us are pushing our kids into the athletic and the entertainment industry. We're not pushing our kids into the areas where they need to be successful. And I'm talking about into the political arena, into the medical field, into the engineering area, agriculture, We need to start pushing our kids into these fields to where they can create a livelihood and sustainability to show that we are effective. We can do more than dribble a ball, shoot a ball, hit a ball, drive a car. You know what I'm saying? We can do more than that. We're more than fast runners. But we need to recognize the fact that We need to start grooming our youth. We need to create programs to groom young black men and women to come up in the political arena and truly be effective without selling out. We don't need no more Kamala Harris's. We don't need no more Cory Booker's. Okay. We don't need none of them. None of them. We don't need that dude. That's the housing. I can't even, the doctor guy. I can't even think of his name right now, but we don't even, we don't need no more of them. We don't need no more of them. We need people that not ashamed to say that, yes, I want to help everybody. 
but I want to help the black community. And I'm not ashamed to say that, yes, this is my plan for the black communities. Right now, every politician is afraid to say that. You got a black agenda? Mm, well, mm. well, black voters are watching. Yes, I do. And that's what they do. And we don't need that. We need somebody that's going to look out for everybody, but not ashamed to say that I care about black people too. Next thing is, and this is my biggest issue right now. This, this is something that really sits with me. It's going to be my second biggest issue. This is number two on my list. But stop getting sidetracked. We as black people have to stop getting sidetracked because too often we as black people get sidetracked from the real objective or the real fight and we turn on each other. Whenever other races engage in a battle, I'm amazed at how quick black men and women separate. How can we go from stop killing black people to a feminist agenda or LGBTQ agenda? While we fight each other, they're getting bills and getting things changed on the federal and local level while we left on the side of the road. Cheering a statue coming down. I don't care how many statues coming down. As far as I'm concerned, educate our youth. Let's do the things I mentioned before, okay? Before we start getting into statues. Because to me, them taking down statues is a way of saying, here, we did something, shut up. Okay, look, yeah, we heard you. Okay, go somewhere. That's how I feel about all that. We got to stop getting sidetracked. Because it's like the minute we come together to say we sick of this, it's like some little side thing comes up and all of a sudden, black men here, black women there, is always something to separate us and keep us focused from the main agenda. It should be about us as a people. Not about male versus female, black man versus black women. Whatever black women fighting for, black men fighting for. Whatever black men fighting for, black women fighting for. I don't know why we always got to be on the separate lines when, when they step in the middle with some of their bull crap. And here's my biggest complaint. Start supporting HBCUs. We have historical black colleges, which are our history. And many of us act like historical black colleges don't exist. Have you ever seen a historical black football game or basketball game on TV? No. But when you do see it, it is the lowest quality resolution that they can show on TV. When you see Georgia and Auburn and all the other schools play, it's this high HD, high quality 4K, you know, presentation of the game. But when it's a black college game, it is the lowest quality available. And they don't even really go out to reduce the show so that it's presented in a way that's appealing to an audience. They make it look as sloppy as possible. We need to start attending our HBCU games, basketball, football, their cultural events. We need to start learning about our HBCU. We need to start supporting our HBCU. And Marcus, shout out to your brother, number 16 basketball player in the, in, in the United States decided that he's going to Howard. That's what I'm talking about. All right, guys, we're going to take a little break and I'll be right back with the final thoughts of today's show. We'll be right back. So keep it locked here with your favorite radio talk show. Hey, this your man Reggie here. Are you looking for some fresh new music? Are you looking for an artist that's got that positive vibe and that positive flow that knows how to flow lyrically? The man, you need to check out Tone G Music with songs like Buzzing, Good Deeds, and Pick Up the Phone. Now, these songs are available on Apple Music and other digital platforms. Tone G brings that positive vibe in everything he does. And the music he brings with the reggae style and that smooth lyrical flow, oh, you know what to do. Y'all check out Tone G Music. We're back with the conversation starter and the voice that works harder. Your host, Reggie. Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Simply Straight Talk show. And you are now into the final thoughts of today's show. Today, I talked about black community focus. And basically, I just wanted to express how important it is that we as black people understand that we have to remain focused. We cannot settle for minor insignificant changes. The changes we need have to take effect on a larger and more grander scale but we got to remain focused and we got to remain united. We cannot be divided. 
Okay, and we cannot be sidetracked. I talked about the importance of teaching African-American history in American schools. You cannot have America's history without including, Afri including African-American history. I talk about the black business structure, the things we need to do as far as not only just setting up storefronts, but we need manufacturing. We need distribution. We cannot depend on celebrities. Celebrities are not going to risk their status. They're not going to risk their money. We don't have James Baldwin, Martin Luther King, and Malcolm X anymore. We now have to rely on our communities, ourselves. Us as a people have to find a way to work together. Now, the things I talked about, I do believe are key and very instrumental into us becoming sufficient, self-sustaining, creating our own economic, you know what I'm saying, our economic uh standpoint to where we can actually look within our own community. We spend millions of dollars every year into other people's economy. We can create our own economy, but mainly the things I talked about are going to help set up something for our grandchildren, our great grandchildren, our children of today. We need to get to the point to where we are educating and developing our youth to where they can get into these political positions and they can actually set a standard of working for the people without saying that, yes, I work for, I'm an American politician, but except for the black people, we need to train our youth to get in there and understand what it means to properly structure a country and policies that's going to benefit everybody without any exclusion. And we need people that's going to get in there and say, I want to work for my community. I'm here because of my community. So we need to start working on those things. We need long-term goals to get ourselves established and situated. Hey, thank you everybody for checking out the Simply Straight Talk show. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please, I want to know your thoughts. What are some ways you feel the black community needs to focus on in order to progress and grow professionally and personally? How can we stimulate the economy within the black community? What can we do? What can we do as a people that's beyond statues? Let's talk about it. Y'all hit me up, man. I thank you for listening. Don't forget, a new show drops every Friday. Be here next Friday for another show. Peace. Thanks for joining us this week on the Simply Straight Talk podcast. Make sure you visit our website at rmviagem.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Lipson, SoundCloud, or Spotify, so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in the show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that will help us out too. Thank you, and see you next week.